the reason why you think Putin is uh, uh, irreplaceable is be precisely because he's like, a, you know, like a witch from the Snow White, you know, who's the fairest of them all? Well, after you poison every Snow White in the country, you know, you're the fairest of them all. And that's the logic of Putin. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantin Kitten. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. A brilliant guest we have for you today, all the way from the motherland itself. He is a political activist, a campaigner, a politician, Russia's most prominent libertarian, Michael Svetov. Welcome to Trigonometry. Uh, thanks for having me. Hi, Constantine. Hi. Yeah, there you go. Well, uh, I, I mispronounced your name or I pronounced it in the English way to start with after you spent five minutes training Francis to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> uh, but listen, welcome to the show. Before we get into the conversation, tell everybody a little about who you are. How are you where you are? Because you're not actually in Russia at the moment. What has been your journey through life that leads you to be sitting here talking to us? Well, I'm Russia's most prominent libertarian, as you mentioned uh, before, and uh, I've been really active in, in the Russian activist uh, circles for the couple of years now, and uh, I've uh, organized some of the most uh, successful rallies in Russia. Not many people know that the Libertarian Party of Russia organized a rally of 60,000 people in Moscow just a couple of years ago, two years ago to be exact, uh, in defense of uh, free speech online, in defense of uh, uh, privacy of conversation, in defense of Telegram. It was a big news uh, in the international media as well and I, I played a major role in organizing those those rallies. I'm also famous for uh, reading lectures about libertarianism and the, my biggest accomplishment is that I actually uh, toured Russia from Kaliningrad to Yuzhno-Sakhalinsk, that's the far east of Russia, uh, reading lectures in over 70 cities of Russia. All of them were very successful and that's my biggest accomplishment, something I'm most proud of uh, apart from lectures. and. Uh, uh, the other thing I'm really proud of is I organized lecture by Hans Hermann Hoppe in Moscow. It was the most, uh, the biggest lecture uh, read by a libertarian in the world. Uh, over 1,600 people attended. It was. It took place in the big concert hall. Uh, the recording is available on my YouTube channel. And nothing like this, uh, at, at least for, as far as I know, has never been done anywhere else. I mean, 1,600 people listening to a lecture read by a philosopher and economist, that's something. So whenever people act surprised that Russia has a libertarian party and it's been quite prominent for uh, for the last several years I always act surprised in return because you know we did things that seem impossible even in the US uh, and uh, seem ridiculous in, in Europe so that's something I'm really proud of well it's great to have you on and I think uh, we'll get into some of your work a little bit further on but I think it's impossible to discuss anything about Russia particularly for uh, a Western audience which is mostly who we have without contextualizing it a little bit, because uh, most people, I know this for a fact, in the West don't really understand what's happening. To be honest with you, I, don't, I wouldn't even claim to necessarily know the ins and outs of, of what's going on. So can you give people, first of all, a broad perspective of where Russia is today? What has happened? Uh, who is Vladimir Putin? How has he been in power for so long? You know, all the electoral shenanigans that are going on and all of that. Can you just give people a big picture view before we get into everything else? Well, yeah, Russia is in a very difficult place right now. Uh, we just had elections two days ago, and they were a fraud with uh, uh, with uh, falsifications, with uh, ballot stuffing and things like that. And basically, United Russia, that's the Putin's party, claimed victory, uh, even though they didn't gather enough votes to actually win properly. But there's nothing a civil society can do, so there's no rallies because most of the activists has been jailed. Uh, like. The last nine months were spent uh, just jailing every single dissident in Russia. So the, the, the biggest story you probably heard about is uh, the story of Alexei Navalny, who's been poisoned by Novichok in, last year. Uh, he survived. He found people who attacked him. He dared to come back to Russia, uh, and he was apprehended and put to jail right in the airport when he, uh, when he, um, when he boarded off the plane. Uh, so that's the situation we've been in we've been struggling with in the past months and uh, I myself had to leave Russia because most of my team, like the people who made the, the successes that we'll be talking about today possible uh, last year, 
two years ago, three years ago, most of them were dispersed. Some of them are uh, under house arrest right now. Some of my closest allies are under house arrest. Most of my allies had to flee Russia. I left Russia myself as well, not because of the direct political prosecution, even though just three months ago I was in jail, three months ago I had a, another house search, uh, my house searched again. So that's the kind of pressure we're living under. And Russia's been very, very difficult place to do any kind of political activism. But, and it's getting worse, unfortunately. It's interesting that you're saying it's getting worse because hasn't Russia always had this history of, you know, powerful leaders crushing down on you know the individuals and you know the people who live in Russia. Yeah, but we had this window of freedom um, twenty years from our early nineties to let's say to the late noughties that uh, uh, that felt freer than ever before. But now that Putin cracked back. Uh, uh, crack back on the civil society, now it's getting really bad again. So Russia today is very different from Russia two years ago. As I mentioned, uh, the kind of work I've been doing in Russia for the past years is impossible today. Like the biggest example, two years ago, I opened um, the first libertarian club in Russia called New Sincerity, and it felt like a good idea just two short years ago, but then the whole thing with Navalny happened, the poisoning, his survival, his return home, uh, and his incarceration, and now it's something that's impossible to imagine. I had to close it down. Police uh, uh, raided several times. They forced us to close for several months, and it's uh, impossible to hold a place uh, of conversation anymore, even though a kind of conversation was possible just recently, even less than a year ago, it was still possible. Really, the things turned uh, to the worst nine months ago when Alexei Navalny came, uh, came back to Russia. And, and why, why is that? Why is this sudden crackdown happening? Is it because Putin has felt that his power is being threatened, that he's not as strong as he used to be, therefore he needs to introduce more draconian measures? Well, he's uh, as strong as he used to be. Uh, the reason why he's uh, cracking down is because he saw example of Ukraine, he saw example of Belarus. I think that's uh, what triggered him mostly. Uh, he saw that people flooded the streets and he wanted to act in advance. He wanted to prevent that from happening. You're talking about and the to, protests uh, in those I'm countries. I'm talking about the protests in Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine had a proper revolution. Belarus had an attempt at revolution, which failed uh, thanks, well, thanks uh, uh, to, uh, to the draconian measures of Lukashenko. Uh, you probably heard about it as well. So Putin wanted to, to act in advance. He wanted to, uh, to not allow this kind of protest to happen, to shake his power. So he cracked down on any kind of person who dared to say something against the, against the party. So um, he's, a, he's a smart tactician. I think what people don't realize about Putin is that he's a, he's a very smart politician. He's bad for the Russian people, he's bad for the, for the country, but he's uh, very smart in the way he's, he deals with power uh, and uh, that's why he's been staying in power for over 20 years now. Uh, Mikhail, l let me take you back to my earlier question because we, we didn't yeah. get a chance to get into it. Put your historian hat on for us. Let's go yeah. back to 1998, when you and I were both quite young still. Yeah. Explain to people the entire process since, because uh, most people in the West don't know how Vladimir Putin came to power. They don't know how he managed to serve more terms than was originally allowed by the Constitution. They don't understand mm -hmm. the whole... Uh, the situation with uh, Dmitry Medvedev. Like, just give us a brief history of the last 20 years, because I think that would be very helpful for any conversation. Oh, okay, we well, uh, Putin has been appointed as a successor of Yeltsin, Boris Yeltsin, the president of Russia. Uh, nobody knew who he was back then. They, uh, uh, they felt like he, they, he can be easily controlled. That's why all the oligarchs, Russian oligarchs, backed him as well. But when he rose to power, he uh, emerged as this kind of strong man, quite popular at the time with the, with the general public, because he was cracking down on oligarchs, and nobody liked oligarchs. So he basically cracked down on the same people who brought him to power. And that gave him a very great measure of support in his first eight years uh, when he was in power. Then he sort of surrendered uh, the presidential uh, post to Dmitry Medvedev, who was his closest ally. And uh, 
at the time, everybody was ca- talking about how Dmitry Medvedev can uh, prove to be a liberal shift uh, in the politics of Russia, how he was different from Putin's. But to me, it always felt, it always felt ridiculous because I remember the interviews that, uh, that Putin gave uh, in 1999 when he was first appointed as a prime minister back then, before he became president. One of the first interviews he gave, uh, he was asked, you know, other people you trust uh, uh, you can trust 100%, other people you can rely on. And he named one person whom nobody knew at the time, uh, whose name country didn't learn for another eight years, and that was Dmitry Medvedev. He said, that's the person I can rely on 100%. So when uh, they made the switch rule, when the Medvedev became uh, became president, I was sure that, you know, that's basically the same party, the same person ruling the country. And it proved to be correct when they switched back uh, four years after that, when Medvedev uh, seceded the, the presidential post to back to Putin again. And after that, after that, uh, things turned uh, more authoritarian. So if in the first eight years, Putin generally was a very liked president. Like, I didn't like him, most of dissidents didn't like him, but it was hard to argue that he was really popular. Uh, after that, uh, the Ukrainian war happened, this, the annexation of Crimea, uh, and that gave him a different kind of boost, the different kind of boost of popularity than he had before. Uh, he, the, the, the patriotic the sensibilities rose, uh, and he rode this, this wave for, for several years again. Now it's a different story. He doesn't have a success story anymore. He's burned, he's burdened by the mistakes and he's burdened by the uh, economic stagnation, uh, but he's, um, he's uh, driven by will of power and he's closest allies, his, the, the, the circle of people that's been with him for 20 years, it's so uh, tight and uh, so well organized that there's really nothing you can, <laughs> you can do to, uh, to, uh, um, to fight against it, unfortunately. So, and the, 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 last, uh, the last development was the, the whole thing with Alexei Navalny in Belarus. Alexei Navalny got poisoned, Belarus had attempted revolution, which gave uh, Putin this historical sense that revolution is something he had to prevent in Russia, and that's what he's doing right now. And, uh, yeah. And would you say that he is a good leader, not in terms, obviously, of human rights, where the, uh, Russia's human rights record is abysmal, but in the way that he runs the country, the way he runs it fiscally, etc.? Uh, you see, th- there's different between there's a difference between good leader and competent leader. He's a mm. competent leader. I don't think he's a good leader. I think he's driving country to the ground, but uh, uh, he's been doing it very competently, and uh, he didn't <laughs> allow any kind of any kind of uh, uh, dissent uh, during his uh, well, five terms in power now. And why is it that he's been allowed to serve five terms? If, as uh, Constantine alluded to, there was a set limit. Well, there is a limit uh, on consecutive terms. So you can't stay uh, president for three consecutive terms, only two consecutive terms. But uh, uh, if you make a switcheroo, the kind of switcheroo that he did with Dmitry Medvedev, then you're allowed an extra two consecutive terms. And then we had this uh, referendum. Well, it wasn't really a referendum. It was a plebiscite uh, where uh, he asked people if it was all right for him to change the constitution to allow him to stay in power pretty much indefinitely. And that's happened last year, uh, the big plebiscite. So now there is no limit whatsoever. And the one thing that we think of Putin in, in the West is that his ruthlessness, particularly when it comes to his enemies and particularly when it comes to the use of poison. Why does he do that? Why, and particularly, why is it always poison? Because it works. I mean, uh, the question you should ask yourself is why shouldn't he do what he does? Because it leads him to, it allows him to reach the goals that he sets. So the ends justif- justify the means. He deals in real politics, so, so he doesn't really have an ideological agenda. That's what people in the West don't really realize, I think. And he does whatever works. So the poison works, so why not use poison? Uh, it's less messy than hiring an assassin. It's uh, uh, less troublesome than dealing with people politically, you know. And He's not as acute uh, in uh, public politics as he is in real politics. And real politics works. So whatever works, he's willing to do. But hang on, surely, like, you know, if you look at the case of Alexander Litvinenko, which happened uh, around 15 years ago, the Salisbury poisonings, I mean, that's been condemned by all everybody around the world, practically. Surely that isn't an effective tactic, is it? Doesn't that just alienate everybody? 
Well, of course it is an effective ta tactic. Okay, he's been condemned, but what did the West really do to Putin? I mean, there hasn't been really any meaningful sanctions. There hasn't been any meaningful backlash. When he annexed Crimea, you know, all the West did is said, well, you shouldn't really do that. Uh, so <laughs> he, feels like, uh, he feels like he's been doing everything exactly the way it should have been done. Uh, and uh, I understand this will be a difficult question for you to answer, but let me ask you anyway. Liberal-minded people like you and I, I think, in Ru of Russian background or who lived in Russia, I think we're in the minority, wouldn't you say? Would, is it not fair to say that most people in Russia support what Vladimir Putin is doing? I mean, I would argue, and I've argued many times in the past, and, you know, feel free to argue with me, which I think you will. Um, you know, Russia's never been a democracy. There's never been a single democratic transition of power, truly democratic transition of power in the entire history of our country g going back centuries and centuries and centuries. Isn't Vladimir Putin just one of those, you know, Peter the Great, Ivan the Terrible, you know, whatever, just a typical Russian leader and Russian people love that? Well, he, he definitely likes to think of his of himself that way, but I think uh, people never had a chance to actually uh, develop this kind of tradition. So there is always a moment in time where, you know, dem democracy emerges out of a free society. And Russia had the chance, you know, if the leaders allowed that for that, you know, this tradition could have emerged. We've seen the same thing happening in the Eastern Europe, for example, after the uh, period of the Soviet occupation, you know, they developed healthy democracies. In Russia, we were never allowed that. So uh, I think it's an unfair question to ask, you asking if Putin is really, you know, his, his uh, uh, means are justified if he's uh, uh, really popular because uh, we don't know really. There is no freedom of speech, there is no freedom of association. Any kind of political organization is being crushed once it reaches any kind of success. So uh, the kind of institution that could have developed in the past 20 years, that could have uh, uh, became a backbone of a new free society, were crushed. So of course right now there is no alternative to Putin, but the only reason there is is no alternative to Putin is because Putin did everything in his power uh, to make it so. That's his. Uh, that's his. Uh, the, I think it's what all tyrants and all dictators do. Really, they destroy any meaningful opposition, and they come to to the public and say, "Well, look, there is nobody except me," and that's exactly what Putin did. So how popular do you think he actually is? Because you make a very good point. For example, Cha Ceausescu, the Romanian dictator, he had a 93% approval rating the day before he was taken out and shot, <laughs> right? So he was obviously not that popular, but but in, in dictatorships, as I take your point, the, the popularity rating, according to polls, is kind of irrelevant. So how popular yeah. do you think he actually is in, in Russia? I think he was very popular throughout most of his time in power, but I think it changes right now. And the, le the last election we had just two days ago uh, showed that his party, United Russia, couldn't... Uh, achieve the success that they were hoping for so they had to use they had to use stuff ballots they had to use they had to falsify the elections in order to to secure the seats that they uh, that they needed and there's a really clear evidence that the last election was heavily falsified uh, on both ends on offline ballots real life ballots and on the digital uh, election front as well we have this digital election system uh, based on blockchain that that's been used to uh, to actually swing the election in favor of united russia mikhail wouldn't you say that actually russia needs a putin you know because it, it's a country that is not particularly stable it's large and if you have a democracy, wouldn't that therefore mean that there'd be certain parts of it that want to become independent and it would be fundamentally unstable as an entity? Well, I think people should be given a chance. Uh, there will never be an alternative to a dictator as long as there is a dictator in power. So we will never know what, would the, what other options are. So we have this, uh, well... He's an opposition leader, we, we, we call him that, Alexei Navalny, the, 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 the man I mentioned earlier. And uh, he managed to uh, gather a serious support in Russia. He had uh, chapters of his, uh, uh, of his organiza uh, organization in every major city in Russia. He, to he, uh, he ran for mayor of Moscow and almost won uh, several years ago. And he hasn't been allowed to, to participate in elections ever since. So uh, the, 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 the reason why 
you think Putin is uh, uh, irreplaceable is be precisely because he's like, a, you know, like a witch from the Snow White, you know, who's the fairest of them all? Well, after you poison every Snow White in the country, you know, you're the fairest of them all. And that's the logic of Putin. And has his reign been undermined? Is coronavirus playing a big factor in this? That well, the, I, the, the, go for it. Yeah, well, I think uh, the, the whole thing with coronavirus is just, uh, uh, it's been so depressing, not just in Russia, but in the entire world as well. In Russia, it's being used exactly the same way it's been used in the US and in Australia right now. Basically, every time it's convenient, you know, you crack down, you say that there's a quarantine, uh, you have to stay home. There is this whole uh, criminal case against activists uh, right now who are basically uh, being framed for spreading the coronavirus by, by means of organized a political rally. So it is being used for political means whenever it's convenient, but whenever there is a big prestigious event like uh, the uh, uh, like the, the the European football match that took place in in uh, in St. Petersburg a couple of months ago, you know, all the all the quarantine measures are being lifted whenever there is an election, and that was very very uh, funny as well. We had elections that I mentioned two two days ago, and all the quarantine measures were lifted. And once they were over, um, the government uh, came in and said, "Well, you know, you can't have rallies, you can't uh, oppose the election results because we have coronavirus, and actually we're bringing back your codes as well." So. It is being used by a tyrannical government to to uh, uh, to to reach its political means. Yeah, mm. and Mikhail, the other thing that people in the West often associate with Russia, without really understanding the full meaning, is that people describe Russia as a kleptocracy, which I know is another thing, one of the things that you would be concerned about as an as an yep. opposition activist. Can you explain to people in 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 a kind of broad brush detail? what that actually means. Because I think, again, in my experience, people in the West have absolutely no idea what, what we're talking about. Well, kleptocracy basically is when you have uh, the ruling class and the, the Putin and his closest associate dealing with uh, using the government budget as their own piggy bank. And that's what they've been doing for the past 20 years. Every single friend of Putin's became extremely rich in the past 20 years. And the kind of crippled down economy that they usually took in the West, uh, it works It works uh, in, the, in the nepotism kind of way in Russia. If you know someone who knows Putin, you will be well off. If you manage to suck to the government, you'll be well off. But there's no really a fair economy. There's no really market economy anymore because everything relies on if you have connections, uh, then you can do business. If you don't have connections, like Pavel Durov, for example, he was the one he was the only real capitalist we had. He uh, created Vkontakte uh, social network, which is the biggest uh, rival of Facebook's in Russia, uh, and it occupies a major uh, part of the market. And it's been uh, basically stolen from him by the Putin's oligarch, Alisher Osmanov. Uh, so he had to flee Russia and he created Telegram and Telegram became the biggest messaging platform in Russia as well. But it's not based in Russia anymore because it's dangerous. And Pavel Durov basically can't return back to his home country uh, under, under threat of, of arrest. Uh, so uh, basically whatever Putin's cronies want, they take and there's no repercussion because there's no fair trial. There's no uh, justice system. Uh, everything is corrupt and uh, uh, everything is for grabs if you're in power. And Mikhail, when I was in China, it, it, there was a very sort of similar system in many ways. However, for the average Chinese person, if you don't get involved in politics, if you don't question authority, if you just want to go about and live your life, life is actually not bad. In fact, it's pretty good. Is that the same in Russia? Well, uh, I actually argue about that uh, in regard to Russia and China as well, because uh, you never know what may become politics tomorrow. And there, there is this huge case be, uh, happening right now in Russia, the case of uh, uh, Yuri Kavansky, who was a blogger. He reviewed the uh, food, you know, junk food and stuff like that. And apolitical whatsoever. But 10 years ago, just think about it, 10 years ago, he sang a song about a terrorist act that happened in Moscow. It was a satirical song. It was made in bad taste, but it was a satirical song sang by someone who was never involved in politics in his life and just a couple of 
a couple of months ago. He was brought to trial. He's tried as an extremist and a terrorist. He's actually in the same list as a uh, uh, as a ISIS terrorist right now. He's been put in the same list by the Russian government uh, for singing a song 10 years ago. So you never know what may become politics. You never know when you may become inconvenient. Uh, and it's uh, been spreading like a rash uh, in the past months because once the, uh, the thing with repressive machine uh, is that once you get rid of real enemies or at least some people you perceive as real enemies you still need someone to oppress because you need to prove your worth to the government to the people that are paying you money to the people that uh, uh, decide that you are still useful so you have to invent enemies and once the real uh, political activists are out of the picture uh, they start to prosecute innocent people and that's what happened to Yuri Kavansky my good friend Maria Matuzna she's been in the Western news as well uh, she was in the list of extremists and terrorists as well for sending a meme in her private message to a friend when she was living in uh, in a tiny city in Russia. So she was not a political activist back then. She is now because of the story she went through. But she was not a political activist back then. And still she was tried as a terrorist simply for sending a meme. And there are stories like this happening all the time. The biggest one uh, out of three is the case of Ruslan Sokolovsky, who was a blogger as well. And uh, he, he recorded a video catching Pokemons, playing Pokemon Go inside a church. And for posting that video, uh, he's been put in the list of uh, terrorists and extremists, the same kind of list where people who actually bomb pe and kill people uh, are being put in. And um, it, it took us over a year to, to, to help him uh, get out of trouble. So, no, it's not enough. Uh, it's not good enough uh, if you're not interested in politics because, one, because politics will get interested in you. And uh, when it happens, there's nobody left to help you. Mm. And Mikhail, you, you mentioned something that I think is actually very important, something that, yeah. you know, I haven't lived in Russia for over 20 years now, but the one thing I really do associate very strongly with is Russian culture, Russian literature, Russian, the, the whole cultural sphere, which, mm -hmm. you know, Russia has produced some of the greatest poets, the greatest artists, the greatest writers, a little bit depressing, <laughs> but nonetheless, the greatest writers in, in history even during very difficult, oppressive times. What has been the impact of the last 20 years on the cultural life of Russia, on the ability to produce the great satirists? I know that, for example, my, one of the people I really used to respect, like Viktor Shandorovich, he he's not able to really be a satirist anymore. He, he's become a sort of dissident commentator because he can't actually mm -hmm. make comedy shows on TV as he used to. And other things like that. Has has all of this stunted the cultural aspect of Russia? Or has actually spurred it on as it has done sometimes in the past. Uh, no, no, it stunted the Russian culture as well, and it uh, ceased to be international. Like the kind of authors you are uh, referring to, the Dostoevsky and Tolstoy's, they were they were all in the past and the Soviet era during the Soviet times. We have this saying that the Stalin he took uh, Russia with great Russian literature and uh, left uh, and left Russia with the uh, lit literary societies. And it sounds better in Russian anyway. <laughs> it does. Uh, yeah. but, uh, it does. It does. Uh, but the point is, the point is that um, we don't don't have uh, strong culture anymore because uh, culture needs freedom and uh, the much better example to be honest is what happens in the ch in China uh, I always been fascinated that China managed to become this economic juggernaut you know they have these factories and they import pretty much all the uh, consumer goods uh, to the world but there hasn't been a single decent movie coming out of China in 20 years there hasn't been a single good song coming out of China in 20 years sure they produce local culture but there hasn't been uh, uh, any cultural success international cultural success coming out of a country of almost 2 billion people and they haven't had Japan, a gangnam you know, style yeah, well, Gangnam Song is is Korean, you know, that, yeah. that's, the, that's the point I'm making, you know, Korea, they have K-pop and they have the, um, the, 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 liter the, the movies, you know, uh, the Parasite was a great movie, the, the Korean cinema is on the rise, you know, the Japan, they had the anime and manga that took world by, uh, by storm, and that's the country of what, 150 million people, and a country of, a country of 2 billion people didn't produce a single decent uh, cultural product that tells you something about the, uh, how freedom affects the society. So it's the same thing in Russia. Uh, Russia doesn't have its uh, intellectual freedom any, anymore. And when you have no intellectual freedom, you have no culture, unfortunately.
That's such a good point about freedom. And, and Mikhail, one of the things I wanted to ask you, and I think a lot of our audience would be curious to know, I know people often are interested in my opinion about things as an outsider, but you are sort of much fresher off the boat, if you like, in terms mm -hmm. of leaving Russia much more recently. What do you see in the West as an outsider in terms of, you know, I think a lot of people in Russia would look at the West often as, as a place where there's a lot of freedom. Maybe some people would not mm -hmm. in Russia would think there's too much freedom, but nonetheless. What do you notice as, as a person who's been forced to, to, to be in different parts of the world? You've, you've been to all over the place, New Zealand, Brazil, yeah. et cetera. Uh, what do you see as an outsider? Well, the, the, the biggest problem the West, the West faces today is the loss of moral high ground. And I've been writing about it incessantly, is uh, that the U.S., during the Cold War, the U.S. was this shining beacon of hope, you know, freedom, some, uh, an example we were striving to follow. But now it's much harder to make that case because there is no more uh, moral high ground left. Uh, and the biggest blow to, to my ideology, like libertarian ideology, came from the U.S. It came from the ideals that founding fathers uh, were talking to, the idea ideas of classical liberalism, the ideas of individual freedom, uh, the ideas of uh, just law. But uh, uh, when Julian Assange was uh, first uh, uh, put under house arrest in the Ecuadorian embassy and now he's uh, under proper arrest in the UK, uh, to me that seems un un unthinkable. I can't defend uh, the freedom of speech as efficiently as I used to be able to, because now every time I bring up, you know, the Western media, uh, there is always this case of Julian Assange. That's basically a person who's been incarcerated for doing editorial work. He was uh, working as a journalist. He never had access to uh, secret documents. He never uh, had access to government secrets. So why is he in jail? Nobody can. Ex there is no good explanation. The other big blow was, of course, the, 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 the what happened to Edward Snowden. And again, there's much better case that can be made in, against Edward Snowden that he actually uh, did commit a government crime. It was for the good, he was a whistleblower, but there was an actual crime taking place. But I'm, I was fascinated that the only country that Edward Snowden found refuge in was Putin's Russia. That tells you something. He couldn't go to uh, Merkel's Germany, he couldn't go to France, uh, he couldn't go to Netherlands, he couldn't even fly through Europe because uh, because there was a threat that the the plane will be landed uh, somewhere and he will be extradited to, back to the U.S. So he had to f to seek refuge in Putin's Russia, and that was a huge a huge win for Putin. That was a huge a win for his prestige, I think, uh, and. I think that's something the West should really reflect on because the loss of moral high ground has been this red threat uh, that's been going through Western politics in the last 10 to 15 years uh, and it's getting worse day by day and I, I understand that this whole justification of you know a noble lie you know we have to do that to prevent a catastrophe from happening but uh, that's what brings about a catastrophe, uh, like what happened during the uh, elections of 2020 in the U.S. Uh, for uh, it divided the country. Not it. It. It, uh, it was. Let me rephrase myself. So politics became global, right? Uh, so whatever happens, whenever something happens in the U.S., whenever something happens in the United Kingdom or in Europe, uh, it's uh, being interpreted by the government and by the governments and by the civil societies of other countries and in Russia, of Russia as well. And when we saw what happened uh, during the 2020, when Donald Trump was uh, banned from all social media, uh, just think what kind of message it sent to Vladimir Putin. Hey, here's this platform, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Google, whatever, YouTube, that claims to be a platform of free speech, yet they uh, banned the most powerful person in the world who was uh, uh, to become the uh, biggest opposition leader in the U.S. because they can, because it's politically convenient. So they're not protecting freedom of speech anymore. Uh, they're using it to, to, uh, to sway elections. They're using it to, um, to silence the dissent. I will do the same in Russia because, not just because they're doing the same, but because them, them controlling uh, who gets to say what on Twitter is direct threat to Russian politics within uh, within uh, Russian society because everyone in Russia uses Twitter as well and just think what it means in terms of election just think what it means in terms of uh, Google was to ban uh, someone from United Russia from its feed uh, it was it can sway election in elections in Russia and that sort of drives Putin's that sort of drives his uh, distrust to the West. 
uh, and it drives distrust of the civil society as well because we see these things happening in, in the West and now we doubt if it actually can be better. So the biggest weapon the, uh, the, uh, the US had during the Cold War was its moral high ground, was its uh, uh, respect, for, uh, respect for values, even if when it was inconvenient, but now that it lost that, it's really hard to distinguish uh, between Putin and Biden, for example, because, yeah, there, there, there are nuances and there's no moral equivalency yet, but uh, it's uh, looking much grayer. Uh, and the distinction is uh, much less pronounced than it used to be just uh, 10 years ago. Hey, Constantin, do you love trigonometry? Of course. Incredible interviews, hilarious live streams, hard-hitting satire, plus my handsome jawline. Whatever takes away from your hairline. But if you do love trigonometry and you want to support us, there's only one place to do that, and that's on Locals. Yes, Locals is a brilliant platform that has been incredibly supportive to our show and other problematic creators. The great thing about Locals is that it's a community for people who love trigonometry. That's right. It's a place for you to hang out with like-minded people, share thoughts, memes, and discuss the show. You can enjoy it for free, but it also gives you the option of supporting us for as little as $7 a month. And if you want to give more, you can. We have incredible rewards for our higher tier supporters as well. We've got everything from mugs, monthly group calls, and one-on-two -on -two chats with me and KK. Get in. Join our community by hitting the link in the description and the pinned comment below. See you there, guys. Isn't it also as well, Mikhail, is that at one point you saw America as a unified country. Whereas you look at America now, it seems yeah. to be a country at war with itself. Oh yeah, but, but, but it's, uh, it's America's problem. So America always had dissent within its borders and I think it's quite normal for a democracy, for a liberal democracy to disagree with each other. Uh, but what I think is not normal is uh, having the kind of uh, Putin-esque uh, censorship that's taking place in social media. And I know there is this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, fig leaf of explanation that, you know, well, it's a private property, so uh, they can ban whomever they want. But we uh, saw the leaks from the White House that, you know, the White House actually helps Facebook and helps Twitter to create white lists of people who it will not ban. Uh, we saw the conversation that the tech oligarchs had with the uh, Democratic administration just before the election. So it all raises red flags, and uh, I think this is a much bigger story. Mm, I agree with you. But to summarize what you said, and I think I, I really want to, people to get the point that you're making, which is when we in the West fail to live up to our stated goals and ideals, we, not only are we undermining our own society, we are giving power to dictators and tyrants around the world because they can point at the West and go, well, look, they're not doing freedom. Why would we? I just I want just to precise your point a little bit. It's not just about pointing uh, in the in the other direction and saying why can't we do the same. It's also about real politics, and I mentioned real politics before. Is uh, people in other countries use Western social media, and when Western social media is uh, being censored in favor of a political party or a political force in the U.S., uh, it triggers every single other country. Uh, to uh, you know, to 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 defend itself because it feels like the same kind of private censorship, call it what you will, will be used in local elections as well to sway the elections in favor of a different country, of a country that controls Facebook or Twitter uh, or YouTube or Google or whatever. So in terms of real politics, it's a much graver situation. So it's not just ideology, it's not just moral high ground. Uh, it's uh, um, it's real politics that that changes it all. So. The, the, the reason why Putin is so, uh, became so aggressive in censoring Western uh, social medias in Russia is because he feels that the, the Western social media can be used to interfere in Russian elections. The same thing is being felt in Hungary. The same feel, thing is being felt in uh, Poland. And to be fair, this, the same thing is being felt in France as well because, um, well, you remember the reaction of uh, Macron and Angela Merkel in Germany uh, when Donald Trump was banned. They didn't endorse it one bit because they felt that the same kind of instrument can be used to sway elections in their own uh, constituencies.
Mm. Well, they're not. They're, they're, they're smart then, because this is the point I've been trying to make to, to British politicians as much as I can. You've got to understand, these people are going to have the power to decide whether you get re-elected or not if you allow this to continue. And, and not enough people, I think, I, I think, grasp that. So with that in mind, what about the, the sort of the stuff that you and I talked about when I was on your show, the culture war, if you like, or the cultural debates, the cultural, I mean, it's not debates really, it's war at this point, I think, that, that, the, that we are seeing here in the West, that all of the discussions about sort of reshaping society, is that happening in Russia uh, or, or is, is, that, is that a thing that sort of Westerners, uh, rich and bored as we are, can get involved with? No, it is, it, is, uh, uh, it is being discussed in Russia as well, primarily because everyone in Russia uses Western social media, and that's uh, being interpreted by Putin as a kind of a cultural war, especially uh, after uh, everything that we just discussed, after the censorship started to take place, etc., etc. So it is a factor. It's not a major factor because the, the grasp of traditional media in, uh, on Russian audience is still quite... Uh, strong, stronger than uh, it is in the West, I think. Uh, but it is being discussed, and I think one other factor that is rarely discussed, and uh, I'm going to put it in the most most mild words possible, is that, well, the, the reality of politics in the world is that uh, um, whenever you have an opposition, the opposition seeks whatever support it can get, and it seeks up, uh, support in other countries as well, and the U.S. is the country that is most generous with its support. And its support is conditional. So whenever it starts to help a certain political group uh, within Russia, and I'm not naming names and I'm not going to tell who I'm referring to, but it's, uh, uh, it's um, happening, happens all the time. Uh, they uh, condition their support with a certain cultural agenda and Democratic Party is much more willing to, to give uh, money for this, uh, sort of, uh, for this sort of activism. So what you get is that you, the, the, the political opposition within borders uh, within borders of a country Russian borders for example uh, gets uh, colored with a certain cultural agenda and that in my opinion that uh, really uh, the, whomever accept this kind of support shoots themselves in the leg M Mikhail, I'm going to interrupt kind of you I'm very yeah. sorry yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. just very yeah. sorry uh, I know I know what exactly you mean but uh, let me state it as Russianly and bluntly as I can okay you're talking about I imagine and correct me if I'm wrong the U.S. says, "Here's some money for your position of efforts, yeah. that's, ex that's but exactly you've what got I'm to saying. you've got to focus it on LGBTQ plus blah blah blah, which will automatically discredit you massively in the eyes of ordinary Russian people." Absolutely, that's exactly what is happening, right. and uh, I think uh, the most obvious example of that we saw in Afghanistan. You saw the videos uh, uh, flowing from Afghanistan. You know, they had gender studies uh, uh, being taught in Kabul. They had, you know, people talking about feminism. And I mean, okay, those those are values that I understand. You feel like you have to defend those values, but you also have to take into consideration, you know, the kind of culture that country has, you know, and work within that culture, because otherwise uh, you'll just, uh, you'll never achieve the kind of ends of uh, building a functional society that were put, uh, uh, that you were striving for in, in Afghanistan. That's, I and that's what I think brought uh, uh, brought the war to the fiasco that it had. Uh, in Russia, the same thing happens as well. The reason I didn't want to put it as bluntly as you did is because I have a lot of friends, you know, who will be watching this show, <laughs> and uh, they'll take it personally. And I didn't want them to take it personally. But that's well, now they, <laughs> <laughs> now they will. <laughs> no, look, I, I, I'm not making any any judgments about it. I'm just uh, trying to tease out the point that you're making. I think. Um, yeah, and, and that makes sense to me as someone who understands Russian culture from the inside. Uh, I don't think uh, it's ac it would be accurate to say that Russia has progressed quite as far as we have in the West in terms of uh, accepting people for who they are, uh, and therefore to make an additional extraordinary emphasis on these marginal issues of sexual identity or whatever would be very off-putting to the ordinary Russian person and therefore would quite likely undermine the effectiveness of an opposition. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that happens as well. It, it also shifts the power balance within the opposition because basically whomever has support from the US or from the UK or from Europe, you know, they have money, they have uh, support of Western media and uh, the kind of people who get the support of Western media are not necessarily the kind of people who will be successful within domestic politics. And it brings all kinds of chaos uh, into domestic politics straight away. 
Mikhail, look, this is a question that a lot of people are going to want answered because we've had a in very insightful, very interesting conversation. But you're talking to us from Georgia. Why are you in Georgia yeah. at the moment? Well, I'm in Georgia in the moment because during the elections, uh, there was this serious crackdown on all kinds of opposition. And I mentioned that just three months ago, I've been in jail. I spent 10 days in jail. It was my uh, fourth time that I was arrested. I had my house searched. Uh, I had uh, my friends threatened and a lot of my uh, allies had to leave as well. Uh, I'm in Georgia right now because uh, uh, I came here just for two weeks. I spent the last three months in South America, in Brazil. I came to Georgia to see some of my friends uh, who are not as well off as I am, uh, who are living here right now and uh, who will have no way to come back because once they return, uh, they'll be arrested the same way that Alexei Navalny was arrested, the same way um, Andrei Pivovarov, a good friend of mine, he was actually took off the plane out of Russia. So he was um, about to leave Russia. He, he went through all the controls, the passport control, etc. Uh, but they took him off the board of the plane uh, and put him in jail uh, just for, uh, for being a political activist. So uh, it's dangerous to do politics in Russia today. Do you think you're going to be able to go back? I definitely hope so. I am not. I don't consider myself a political immigrant because I, I don't like the kind of uh, stigma that uh, uh, that it has. But um, my hope is that I will be able to return. I'm just not sure when. And in the U, the in the West, we tend to paint Russia almost as the enemy. Do you think Russia is a serious threat to the West, or do you think not really? That exact that is no that is an exaggeration by the Western media trying to create a bogeyman, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think Russia is the most convenient boogeyman possible because uh, it's uh, incapable of really posing any kind of serious threat. Just uh, look at the GDP that Russia has. Look at the state of economy. Look at uh, uh, at its uh, well. It has a decent defense budget, but still, it's a, it's a local empire. It's not a global empire like it used to be during the Soviet era. So if you were, but it's much more convenient to 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 prop up Russia as this big enemy because China is scary uh, and, uh, you know, ruining relations with China. Nobody can afford to ruin relations with China, but pretty much everyone can afford to ruin relations with Russia. And that gives you an idea that Russia is not really, uh, does not really pose a serious threat because when someone does pose a serious, serious threat, you don't, <laughs> you don't uh, deal with it the same way that Russia has been dealt with uh, by the West. Mm. Well, the, the last time the Soviet Union posed a genuinely serious threat that we had to, re well, the West had to react to was the Cuban Missile Crisis when, you know, the West, America pulled out all the stops mm. to prevent Russia from having its nuclear missiles right on its border. And I guess what you're saying is the passive response to the poisonings of people in, in Western countries, the invasion of Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera, shows you that the West isn't really that bothered about what Russia is doing because it's kind of local affairs. They killed off a few Russian guys in London, whatever. Who gives a shit, really? Yeah, yeah, exactly that. So Russia does its thing and uh, it can like poison a politician in London if it really wants to, but it will be a Russian politician. Uh, it doesn't have a real sway in European election and the whole Russia gate that happened in the US just felt so ridiculous, come, like watching from Russia. You know, nobody could have done a better PR uh, campaign for Putin than the Democratic Party did because they basically created this kind of, you know, demigod, you know, who rules the American elections, who rules the European elections, elections, you know, who has his hand uh, pretty much in every single crisis in the world. And that's, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, Putin is been fla has been flattered by this kind of coverage. And it's uh, it did a, a lot to raise his prestige within Russia, because uh, if you remember in the 90s, uh, there, it was a, a decade of humiliation. A lot of Russian f Russians felt that, you know, Russia has been humiliated by the, uh, by the term of Boris Yeltsin. And uh, when Putin came back, he said, well, you know, from now on, Russia will be respected. And the kind of you know Russian ga Russia Gate stories and the kind and the propping up Putin as a boogeyman as the world uh, wide boogeyman uh, is actually it feels like uh, uh, respect when you uh, when you live in Russia it feels like well now you know they are afraid and if they are afraid you know they respect us so I think it did more harm than good in terms of creating a functional political. Uh, system in Russia because a lot of people every time there is another Russia gate uh, happening in the US a lot of people see it as a sign of strength uh, of Putin's regime
It's very interesting that you say that because, you know, we, we've been fed this lie again and again. You know, the, the reason Trump came to power was because of the Russians. The reason Brexit happened was because of the Russians. I mean, you tried to get Jeremy Corbyn. And don't, just... don't, don't you fucking start. <laughs> Don't start with that shit. We did not try to get Jeremy Corbyn elected. Even we are not that stupid. <laughs> but if the Russians aren't, uh, aren't the real threat to Western democracy, you intimated that it's actually uh, the Ch uh, China. Is that fair or have I put words in your mouth, Mikhail? Uh, well, I just uh, look at the scale of the country. I I'm not saying that China is the enemy. What I'm saying is that if you need, uh, if you're looking for an enemy, China is a much better candidate uh, for this role because of its the scale of its economy, because of the, its population, because of its ambitions. Look at what happened to Hong Kong. And um, by the way, if we're talking about the prestige uh, of the West, you know, the, it's, it's humiliating to see the um, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, you know, deleting the tweet uh, that uh, the U.S. will stand uh, with uh, with the people of Hong Kong. Uh, it's not, it hasn't been forced. Why would you delete it? J at least have guts to stand by the words, even if you're not going to do something. Something. Uh, so if you're looking for an enemy, China is a much better candidate because it has means to, to, to do harm. Russia ha has no means. So why would you even pay attention to it? Uh, Mikhail, we're coming to the end of our time. I know we've got yeah. our final question as usual, but I actually feel like, is there something about Russia we should have discussed that we haven't so far today? I wish we discussed more the the kind of global politics that we mentioned just once, because politics has become global. A lot of Russians speak uh, English, a lot of Russians consume Western media, and whenever you have these blunders, like the Russian gate, whenever you have this, the, whenever you have censorship, like what happened with Trump or Milo Yiannopoulos, you know, there are YouTube channels that have. Uh, translated lectures by Yano, Milo Yiannopoulos that have millions of views, and whenever he's being banned from 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 the social net from the social media, uh, it's res it resonates far beyond the Anglosphere. It resonates far beyond the U.S. We see that, and we uh, see how it's similar to what's happening within our own countries. And we mentioned Alexei Navalny, for example, and there was this huge discussion when Alex Jones was banned from Twitter and YouTube, etc. That you know, well, Alex Jones is being banned, but but Alexei Navalny is still allowed a platform on the same media when the same case can be made against Alexei Navalny uh, for having his own uh, channel removed from YouTube, for example. And Alexei Navalny uh, realized that himself when Donald Trump uh, has been banned on Twitter, uh, he, uh, he wrote an article basically saying that's an unacceptable act of censorship because he understood that the same logic can be applied to any kind of dissident, to any kind of opposition uh, uh, leader uh, in other countries as well. So global politics is the reality and you have to uh, think twice when you do something locally, because it, especially in the Anglosphere, because everyone speaks English nowadays. It's gonna resonate far beyond what you think is uh, possible. The same goes, the same applies for Brexit. You feel like Brexit is this a local story that doesn't affect anyone except the Brits. But the truth is, when we were looking at the referendum and the attempts to rerun the referendum, the whole world's been following that. The whole world's been following the Trump, Trump re-election. The whole world read about Hunter Biden's laptop. And the whole world saw that the same articles that got you banned on Twitter just a year ago uh, are being reprinted by Politico today, for example, by saying, hey, you know, there's been some truth to that. Let's, uh, let's look into it. Now that the elections are gone, uh, it's safe to discuss it. The same has happened with the co coronavirus, but we're not going to get into that. So the, the biggest point I'd like to make is that politics is global, especially in the Anglosphere. Uh, whatever happens in your district, you know, we're discussing in Russia, we're discussing politics of Florida today, of California, uh, because the cultural victory that the United States and United Kingdom achieved in the past hundred years has also made you a target, uh, have made the, your domestic politics a target of international, uh, of international attention. And that's the, that should uh, le leave an imprint on how you deal with it, I think. But. And what do you think is going to be the future for Russia moving forward? I think it's grim. I don't see any kind of uh, solution to the kind of situation that Putin created today. Uh, I think uh, the only choices are either through a proper junta or through a revolution. 
Uh, I don't see any other ways forward. I may be wrong, but that's how it seems right now. Mm. Well, on that uh, happy note, uh, Mikhail, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure and I think a very valuable perspective, actually, not only on Russia, but also on the West and uh, how we ought to be thinking about some of the decisions that we make and some of the conversations that we have. So I know that our audience will have really appreciated it. Uh, we both certainly do. And with that in mind, before we ask you a couple of very special questions from our fans on Locals, our last question is always the same. What is the one thing we're not talking about that we really should be? I think I already answered that, is that politics is global today, uh, especially uh, uh, politics in the Anglosphere. We should talk about it more. And we should talk about the, uh, the loss of moral high ground by the West. It's, uh, it makes the world a worse place. Whatever, whatever issues you think you're solving by losing the moral high ground, uh, you're not solving it, you're making it much, much worse. Without the West as an example, it's much harder for people like myself to fight for freedom in countries like Russia, and I'm sure as hell that it's the same in China, it's the same in India, it's the same in, uh, in Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So we need an example, and the lack of example will bring uh, the whole world to a much darker place than it is uh, now. Mikhail, thank you so much for coming on the show. If people want to find you online, what is the best way to do that? Well, I have a Twitter, it's M. Svetov, uh, but it's in Russian. And I have a YouTube channel that actually has some English uh, language videos. I had a conversation with Hans Hermann Hoppe, a very prominent libertarian. I had a conversation with, uh, um, with uh, director of uh, FEE, um, Lawrence Reed, and the other prominent libertarians. So uh, you can watch that. It just has Russian subtitles, but it's in English. Mikhail, thank you so much for coming on and thank you all for watching and listening at home. We really appreciate you spending this time with us. We will see you very soon with another brilliant interview like this one or Raw Show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time, which is 2 p.m. Eastern. And if you want to listen to Trigonometry on the go, you can always download it as a podcast. Thank you very much, guys, and see you soon. We hope you've enjoyed this incredible interview. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you never miss another fantastic episode. And if you believe that the work we do here at Trigonometry is important, support us by joining our Locals community using the link below.